This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors, the podcast with a Poutremont. Um, I'm your host, Erica Lance, and we are very fortunate because we have some amazing women from the Author Talk Network today, and this is part three of a three-part series where we have these amazing people on the show and in a partnership. So I'm going to do this a little different. Um, we're going to talk about what we're drinking, but we have to introduce everyone first, and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and their awesomeness. So let us begin with Grace. Um, hi, I'm Grace Salmon. I am founder of the Author Talk Network. I've written three nonfiction books, and my debut novel is called The Eves. And I am delighted and so thankful to Erica for having us on Drinking with Authors. It is one of the most comprehensive, most fun, most collaborative um, things I get to do. And I get to oh, swag, swag, <laughs> drink <laughs> with authors. So thanks for having us. Of course, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Cantrell. I've written a little bit of everything, but I'm mostly known for novels, both uh, historical and contemporary fiction. My latest novel came out a few years back and it's called Perennials. And I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Yay, Mary. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Helen Sheriff. I am the author of Boop and Eve's Road Trip, which is a Southern fiction, uh, women's fiction um, novel. And I'm also an author and marketing coach, and I'm the CEO of Bookish Road Trip, which is a community of readers and travelers. Um, and you can check us out at bookishroadtrip.com. And I also, since you're talking about awesomeness, I will show you my shirt. Please do. Some, it, some work here. There Let's, we go. It says, this wine is making me awesome. I thought it was a perfect shirt to wear tonight. I think it, <laughs> it is, is a perfect shirt, and I'm in a constant state of thinking wine makes me awesome. So, <laughs> okay, let's talk about what we're drinking. So I went to Sonic because in the true spirit of healthy food, they have a grilled cheese double cheeseburger that I just can't even begin to describe how awesome this thing is. <laughs> And it's very unhealthy, but I always get cherry limeade. So what I did is I took my cherry limeade and I put our sponsors Viking um, Lightning, which I talk about a lot on this show because it doesn't take very much of this because it is, um, it's honey and stuff, but it is moonshine. Mm -hmm. And it's from Skunk Brother Spirits. If you use the coupon code DWA10, um, you can get a discount on all of their amazingness. And they use locally grown things. And they're actually out of Washington. They're veteran owned and two brothers own it. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. I guess their grandfather used to be a moonshine smuggler. No, that's not the right word. I can't remember the right word for it, but um, words fail me now. Anyway, that's what that is. Green alcohol, pretty much ever clear. Grace, what are you drinking? So wait, that's healthy alcohol, right? Because it's, it's got very honey healthy and it it's got organic it. and it's organic. So it's organic. Yes, it's locally grown. And I love that it's, um, yeah, it has, it's a very, it's got a very high alcohol content. <laughs> and your drink has fruit in it. Yeah, it does. Well, that's the thing about this. So unless you're a big fan of straight moonshine, you have to put this. And when I talk to Scott, who's one of the brothers, he's like, put it with like lemonade. So cherry limeade partnership made in heaven with my grilled <laughs> cheese, cheeseburgers that I had. Goals. Um, Grace, what are you drinking, my friend? I am drinking my standard drink, which is seltzer and vodka. Very cool. Very. Smirnoff you know, citrus is my favorite. I was going to say, do you have a little lime or lemon in that? Cause no, you know, I am, you know, I like all the high-end vodkas, but I'm basically a Smirnoff girl. Smirnoff citrus and a little seltzer or a lot of seltzer and a little vodka whichever i always do it the opposite way i like the original way you had it it's like look splash look i put water in it it's good it's good julie what are you drinking my friend okay i made a fancy smancy drink so it's uh, a little mm. bit of cranberry juice and some lb 
elderberry. With, I couldn't find straight up elderberry. I was looking for, I say St. Germain. I know it's not the correct <laughs> French way to pronounce it, but I'm trashy. So I also, <laughs> I found some <laughs> pear and elderberry, um, what do you call it? The, you know, the, the little concoctions. Uh, so I poured that in there. A little bit of simple syrup, a little bit of lemon juice, and I popped some basil from my garden and some blueberries and a little bit of lemon, and it's so delicious. It's really refreshing and good and wonderful. Wow, that's like 10 steps more than I'll put into any beverage <laughs> it, that it I have. It really wasn't. Yeah. It, was, it was easy. It, it's I, so I actually was a bartender for a while and made fancy drinks, but I refused it. Like when I met the house, people would be like, look, I got you all these things. And I'm like, cool, Coke, Jack. <laughs> like, <it's> like yeah. <laughs> And moving on. Mary, you can't tell you measurements at all, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, that's the best part about pouring your own drinks. You don't exactly. actually have to measure. Exactly. Uh, Mary, you have a ridiculous um, non-beverage situation. So what's going on there? So I was so excited. Okay, you guys, I was at Costco the other day and they have these things. They're like the things you had when you were a little kid, you know, that you freeze. But instead, they have an alcoholic cocktail in them. And so this one is watermelon hibiscus. And it's delicious. And what's the alcohol? I don't know. It doesn't really <laughs> say. It just says has 8% alcohol. But it just it doesn't say what it is. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome you to the frozen version of Truly. Is what that actually is. That is the frozen version of what they refer to as the basic bitch drink, which means it, what, do you, yeah. what are you calling a basic bitch? What? <laughs> you are not. It's the drink for any of us who drink Trulies. We know that that is yes, but um, it's yeah. <laughs> you probably don't want to know what mine it. too because I don't think the popsicle is going to last me very long and. <laughs> but we'll wait. She's the girl at the party with the drink in both hands. Yeah, here's a bottle if we need it. I mean, we'll live. <laughs> Mary is embracing this. I love it. Yes. Well, we've been very fortunate to have both Grace and Mary on this show before. Terrible amounts of fun. Julie, this is your first time on the show. My first question is going to be. You, when you introduced yourself, the last thing you said that caught my attention was a few years ago. What is happening publishing wise? Do do explain this to me because a few years ago is too long. I'm sure <laughs> That's a good your question. fans that want That's your great. work. What's happening? Okay, so <laughs> since then I have been working mostly as a collaborative writer, a ghostwriter, and an editor, and a teacher, and a story coach. So I have, I wear a ton of different hats. I released um, Crescendo as a work of creative nonfiction. I've done several since then that are ghost written that don't have my name on them that are um, memoirs or creative nonfiction um, and some straight up nonfiction for CEOs and people like that. And then uh, I do a ton of editing work, developmental editing and substantive line editing. And then I teach for Drexel University's MFA program and also do the story summit. So I have a lot of hats that I wear and I love it, all of it. It's fun. It sounds like you have plenty of time to be writing many novels. <laughs> <laughs> I am <laughs> writing a novel right now, but we'll see what happens to it. It's the novel I've been wanting to write for many, many, many years. And I just started it this week. So I'm so excited about it. And I just fucking carve the time to do it. But I, it, it's been in here for a long time. <laughs> Well, when were you first published, Julie? Let me ask you. Oh, my goodness. I started with children's books way back in 20, 2009. I've been around for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, long time. And then I went to historical fiction and then um, contemporary fiction and then creative nonfiction and then memoir and nonfiction. So, and the book you're working on is? Uh, I'm, too, I'm, I'm not going to jinx it. <laughs> Okay. okay, no jinxing, no jinxing. I'm no going to be hum hum about it because it is too fresh and new and, and in my heart. So, yeah. Okay, well, we will. I'll come back on the show and talk about it another time. When you're publishing it, and I'm going <laughs> to yeah. hold you to that. Knock on wood. Everybody cross your fingers, stay for <laughs> A ridiculous yeah. memory. What yeah. about you, Mary? What about your next book? Hmm. Well, as we discussed the last time I was on your show, I'm slow. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have nearly the resume nor excuses that Julie has. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had her go first in this part of the conversation. <laughs> I just feel like that. I like it. <laughs> um, 
I am working on a new novel. I am actually done with draft three. So it's not like it's gotten nowhere, but I think it's got a few more drafts to go. Like, it's not like it's draft three and I'm feeling like it's close. I, I, you know, though, Mary, I'm just going to say you were draft goddess because when last we spoke and how many drafts you go through, <laughs> that is not, not, not every author does 5,000 drafts of their book to get it out. <laughs> It's true. It's true. I thought we agreed upon the last show that you were going to go faster on the draft scenario. No pressure, yeah. Mary. No pressure. Well, <laughs> we faster, schmaster. <laughs> I don't know. So what is this next one that's in draft three? It's um a young adult dystopian novel set in the future. And it's a... um. You know, a pandemic has raged for 30 years. Most of the world lives in isolation and a teenage girl who lives in isolation falls in love with one of the people who doesn't live in isolation. Those cultures clearly clash and it's sort of their romance and the whole dystopian world that they live in and all that good stuff. I love oh, it. I have no idea where you would get an idea about a book like <laughs> that whatsoever. I don't know. It's it. like somebody who's in Florida versus somebody who's in California. That sounds like <laughs> in modern. Hey, don't mock my state. <laughs> hey, I live down there. We all know it's Florida and COVID doesn't exist there. <laughs> so, um, what about you, Grace? Putting you on the spot, my dear. As, as, you, as you are delightfully book. welcome to do. Um, we are collectively, the Author Talk Network is coming out with an ebook, which is called yeah, something about effective writing, tips for effective writing, sharp tips for effective writing. <laughs> Your skills. For... <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great book. So we're coming out with collectively, we're coming out with an ebook. I think this month. So we're really excited about that. Mary and I are going to be collaborating on a book in the fall on um, how to write a book, how to publish a book, and how to market a book. So it's we think it's going to be three different books. Um, Julie doesn't know about that yet, but. She'll probably know. be she'll <laughs> probably she'll probably be included. So we're super excited about that. And I actually am beginning my fourth book and uh, second novel. And I'm really excited about it. I'm trying to take a, a hiatus from social media, but then I get wonderful invitations to hang out with you, Erica, and to drink with authors. So my this novel is uh, typical to the way I write, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I've written the opening chapter and I've written the epilogue and I have no idea what happens in between. No, I, I, you know, brilliant ways of writing, brilliant ways of writing. Last night I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and figured out how to move my story forward. And I did a voice memo that makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> I, so I decided that I'm hoping tonight I wake up and then can detangle that voice memo so I know how to move this book forward because that's where I'm at. And I was, it's just garbled. It's, it's words, but they're not in any sort of sensical order. But I remember waking up to put them in the phone and being like, I have to remember this. <laughs> and then you wake up in the morning, you're like, I've got this. And you hear it and you're like, what does that even mean? Oh. So that's, you guys are all very busy though, that, which is awesome. And um, with, so you're writing a, I, you, you guys have a book coming out that's going to have a cool title that you're going to send me so I can include it in all the no sharp tips episodes. for effective writing that synapse sharp. just closed sharp tips for effective writing. Very, very cool. And then you're working on more nonfiction books. So one of the things is this, the author talk network is there to help authors, mm -hmm. right? People who want to write and how they do that with different things and doing um, webinars and information sessions. And so talk a little bit about, Mary, how you got involved in the Author Talk Network. Um, well, this was Grace's brainchild. And essentially Grace said, hey, I have this great idea and I know these wonderful people and we should all get together and help each other out and collaborate and um, you know, support each other and find opportunities for one another. And that's how it started. And I said, sure, why? Who wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> Very cool. Julie, how did you get involved? 
ditto. <laughs> yeah, that's the easiest way to do that. I appreciate that. You guys all come from different sort of writing backgrounds and stuff. What does that lend itself when you guys have created basically a tribe of authors who are growing the tribe of authors? Um, what is it like coming from the different backgrounds to collaborate? And I'm going to throw it to you, Julie, first. I think it's perfect because everybody brings different experiences, different skill sets, different you know connections and different interests and passions. So what one person doesn't want to work on, the other person is thrilled to work on. I just think it works out well. I, I've always believed in the strength of community and tribe and sisterhood. And I think we're better together. It just works. <laughs> and who wants to be alone in the world all the time? You know, it's better to have a circle around you of good people, good souls who want to elevate each other, not compete with each other, just contribute and put good stories in the world for people to read. That's all we want to do. Have fun. I like that you said that because I think one thing that I've seen a lot with writers, but I really hope every writer understands this, is it's never a competition. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like you're selling a car where you're only going to sell them a car for every once in a while. Right. Like they have a book, but that book could be gone depending on the reader in a day. Exactly. So there's always room in that reader's heart, universe, whatever, for more authors. And I think it's amazing when authors work together to mm -hmm. forward that sort of ideal. What about you, Mary? How has it been having this tribe and stuff? Awesome. I mean, you know, writing can be a super lonely process, um, but it doesn't have to be. And marketing could be something you want to like, just shake your head and scream over, but it doesn't have to be. And if you do these kinds of things with people that you like and respect, it can make it a lot more fun. Very cool. And then Grace, so you started this thing because you thought to yourself, you know, I'm going to retire and write books, but instead... <laughs> I'm going to create this empire. Oh, we are making so much money. I have to tell you. you know, we're, we're... I didn't say it was a financial <laughs> empire. I said it was an empire because you don't do anything on a small scale. You're not like, you know what? I'm going to have a book club every couple months. You're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create this huge thing. How's it been since it began? Well, I think, you know, for me, the essence of it is that I wrote this book Two years ago, I think the, my anniversary, my, my book birthday is this week sometime. And I wrote it because I thought I was done. I really, honest to goodness, I had written three books in education. I was traveling 200 days a year. And I decided to write this novel about what would it be like to be done and be lost in the world? And what happened is my characters taught me I am so not done. So we've got Author Talk Network. We've got um, I sucked up to Mary big time to try to be part of Bookish Road Trip. So we're talking about tribes here. So we've got the Bookish Road Trip tribe. We've got Author um, Talk Network. Um, Julie is part of Tall Poppies. And we're all part of other tribes as well. But again, keeping with that theme of not being competitive, we all find ways to intersect. So for me, when I thought I was done, I did this radio show with this wonderful woman named Gail Carson. She asked me onto her show and she fell in love with our interview and called me like the next day and said, you need to have your own radio show. And I was like, I can't do that. And she said, did you read your book? You're not done. And I went, oh, <laughs> who knew that? So I started I started Storytellers and I've always been an entrepreneur. I've started two nonprofits, two for-profits. So for me, part of the joy, and I was talking to Jocelyn Jones out of Hollywood the other day. She wrote this amazing book called Artist. And she talks about that there are some people where, and this is very true of me, for the joy of the work is in the creation you know, yes, I want my book to succeed. Yes, I want it to go to Hollywood, but it's the joy of it is in the creation. So Author Talk Network is tons of work. I just sent out stuff today about who's going to go to this conference and how are we going to make it work. That's good and fun, but not as much fun as just creating these communities, at least for me. So I love that these um, networks coalesce at the same time. That's very cool. Mary, let's talk about the bookish uh, roadshow. Let's let's talk a little bit about that because I haven't discussed that on the show. What is it? Tell us. Tell us all the things. All right. Well, 
<laughs> all of the things, Mary. All of the all things. of the things, Mary. All of the things. It started in August of 2020. There were four people who lived near me in Richmond, Virginia, and we all had books coming out in the middle of COVID. And several of us, it was our debut book. And if it wasn't, it was only our second book. So none of us were like super well established or anything like that. And we were scrambling, trying to figure out how our book was going to come into a world where bookstores were closed and we didn't know anybody. And <laughs> what are we going to do? And how are we going to meet readers? And what? Ah! And so we decided it would be a, such a super great idea to start a Facebook group and it would be really easy. And, you know, we could meet some readers. Well, OK. How did that go? So the thing is, is that it turns out that at least a few of us in this little foursome are like type A personalities and nothing <laughs> like super easy because we make it like super not easy. <laughs> so it wasn't easy, but Focus Trick started as a Facebook group. It's now, thanks in great part to our membership director, Grace Salmon, um, up to 3,700 people. Um, in just two years. It's people who love to read and to travel. And I think what I really like, well, there are a couple of things I like about it, but one is that there's tons of engagement, uh, you know, more than I see in most Facebook groups. Um, and so that's really neat. Like I've actually met friends. I met Grace in Book a Short Trip. I mean, literally. And now I talk to her about a hundred times a day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh so i you know i really made like real legitimate friends through it um but also it it's a warm place and it's a supportive place and i've had people tell me that gosh you know i wouldn't come on facebook except i come here Aww. or it's nice to have this little corner of facebook where people are like kind and they're not arguing about stuff and you know none of that stuff is here we just don't we just don't go there <laughs> yeah. um and not that that's you know there are places to do that this just isn't one of them mm -hmm. um so that's good well then as we started to grow and we added more people to the leadership team grace being one of those and you know a, a couple others we added an instagram channel we've added three newsletters um, one is for book clubs. What one is for one is for a book club. One is more like a travel essay, um, and then kind of what's going on in our group. And then the other one is for authors who just want to know what sort of opportunities we have available and the ways we could might be able to feature them. So we have three newsletters. Um, we have a blog that we just started, so um, that's on our web page, and. Um, and I don't know where we're going to go from here. We've had one uh, in-person event in Florida, and we're going to have, I think, one in Richmond in September. Um, so, you know, it just keeps growing and getting bigger and more exciting and spreading. And um, it's been a lot of fun. I think that's awesome. And I think what you said to the social media, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were talking about Twitter. And it is so funny because on all of the social media platforms, Less, I think, on, no, I'm not even going to say less, but there on all the social media platforms, you have certain things that occur that can turn you off from that social media platform the way they occur, right? And then you have these great opportunities to meet people because I'm old enough to remember when the internet was really young and there were chat rooms and you would go and you'd find people who wanted to talk about nerdy weird shit that you wanted <laughs> to talk about like star wars before it became nearly as cool as it is now right <laughs> resigned to us nerds you know and but i i love that things like this can be created where people can go and have so much similar interest and be able to do things but in a very positive way and they're not fighting through the torrent that could be how the hell do I find people to talk to about this topic I want to talk about in the midst of potentially um, very caustic things? Because, I mean, if anybody ever watches The Social Dilemma on Netflix, by the way, this will be one of the most terrifying things you do, because <laughs> you find out how the companies, um, and there's, there's another one too, have set up the social media platforms to instigate you being on them by riling up negative emotions. 
They don't go, let's make them super positive and feeling great about themselves. No, it's the exact opposite. So it's fabulous when things like that get creative. Mm -hmm. Created. Woo, it's fine. Lightning. I'm good. It's fabulous okay. when they get creative. It's <laughs> worse. <laughs> where where well, is it? I'm and you know, listen. Erica, I'm going to jump in because I really want to surround myself with positive people. I don't think there's anybody more positive on the planet than Julie Cantrell. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that, I, and I, I mean that sincerely, but she is not Pollyanna either. <laughs> you know, she deal, Julie, you deal with dark subjects. You deal with suicide. You deal with family matters. You deal with a lot of stuff, but you also um, are always focused on bringing the light into the conversation and you know the it, in addition to her being a usa today and a new york times bestseller she's just a stellar person to know that's sweet because of that she's been drinking a little too much of her <laughs> i was gonna say julie how much did you pay her for that right <laughs> yes, yeah. i mean mary, mary is that not the truth julie cantrell is just like thank you. and that's what grace says behind your back too julie. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. You're welcome. Oh, Julie, she mentioned you do something tall, tall. What is oh, the tall poppies? It's kind of like what Mary said. You know, it's it was started by Ann Garvin, and um, she's a wonderful writer and just wonderful soul who brought together. I think we have about forty female writers now, and it's the same kind of thing. We have a readers group on Facebook called Bloom Bloom with Tall Poppies. And I think we have about 10,000 readers on there now, and it's a very engaged, active group. Every day we're posting and exchanging writers and readers connecting with each other, and we bring in guest authors um, lots of times, and a lot of our reader and followers are authors as well, so they can share about their work. It's a very open exchange. We just want to support people and make it, as, as Mary said, a positive place to gather online, because it is hard to find those safe spaces where politics aren't brought in and, you know, religion and all the things that kind of, like you said, charge people. It's just about good people wanting to read good stories and do good things in the world. You know, it's just a positive place to land. I think that's fabulous. Cause what's always interesting to me too, is the, the news. Like, I don't, do you guys Stay away. positive stories in a news feed <laughs> ever? Like, I don't get positive <laughs> stories. There is that website, it's probably still exists called like Upworthy or something like that, that only has positive news stories. I used to go to that sometimes when I was feeling down. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be brilliant. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to do a fun rapid fire question. So we will Ooh. be right back with <laughs> authors. Sample locally sourced quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge at Skunk Brothers Distillery. We're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits located in Stevenson, Washington. Okay. We need to talk about the headgear. So if you are fortunate to be watching the YouTube version of this, <laughs> then you see the headgear. I don't have a tiara, but that's this is pretty much par for the course for me. This is actually what I wear out of the house every day. So um, Julie, do explain the beautiful accoutrements you have for this theme here. Well, speaking of good, positive tribes of people, Kathy Murphy um, started years ago something called the Pulpwood Queens. And it's one of the largest international book clubs. It's based here in Texas, but it has tremendous reach now. And it's just a great group of writers and readers who gather together once a year for the Girlfriend Weekend, which I think they're having in Amelia Island in January. Um, and she loves to make everybody feel comfortable to just let it all down and have fun in a good, safe, positive way. So she kind of, I wouldn't have feather boas and crowns if it weren't for Kathy and her fun events. And so now she's just kind of, that's, that's, we're passing it forward. We're paying it forward with Kathy's energy and the positivity here tonight. We just figured we'd bring the party. <laughs> so anyone who's right now listening or watching, I need you to pause, go get a tiara or, a crown, <laughs> right. or the correct headgear, put it on to continue this episode. That's right. So everybody does that. Okay, I love that. So um, fun rapid fire questions. The cool part is there's three of you. So one of you is going to be called on to go first and then the other ones get to think about their answer. No stress whatsoever. Um, so fun question. 
what movie or TV show did better, you think, than the book? Mary. Oh, better than the book. Um, like, you're not saying the book was bad, but the way they did the movie or the TV show was good. Okay, I'm going to horrify everybody. Lord of the Rings. No, there's a lot of walking in those books. I think you're correct. Like, I like the movies better. Yeah. I, I have to be careful saying that because I have many listeners who are like, what? Why I said I'm going to horrify people. I horrify people in my house by That's saying. That's okay. You guys, <laughs> any hate mail, I'll tell you how to get hold of Mary. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Grace, what about you? There has never been a movie better than a book. <laughs> I got I got one. Julie, what about you? You know, this is, I, I, the, it's commercial and it's for kids, but I just thought they did a good job with The Hunger Games. I the whole trilogy yeah i thought they did a good job with that I especially to be a kid's story yeah i think i agree with you i think the movies are fantastic but i also really love the books they're equally great which is surprising yeah. you know it's, it's rare yeah. but i think she's such a brilliant writer and a master at plot and she had that in mind when she wrote them so she knew exactly how to frame the story so that it would be easily adaptable to film and she just she's spot on it's a great study for plot structure that's for sure Okay, I got two for you guys. Let's see. Devil Wears Prada. I just watched that this week again. I never read it. <laughs> if you read the book, the yeah. lead Anne Hathaway's character is terribly unlikable. If you read the book. <laughs> and the other one that I think they did really well with is I think Sex in the City, the TV show, was better than Four Blondes. I never saw it. I so, saw it. I never read it. <laughs> <laughs> I never did yes. either. <laughs> Well, we're, we're going to discuss your level of culture that, no, you haven't read every book on the planet. Why not? Just kidding. Just I'm kidding. feeling ashamed. <laughs> I hope so. I hope, no, just kidding. Um, okay. What about this? What is your favorite weird food combination, Julie? Oh my goodness. I don't know. I, that's a really hard one for me. I, oh goodness. Here, I'll buy you some time to think. Yes. I'll jump in. Okay. When I was in college, I used to have for dinner sometimes pickles and bacon. <laughs> well, I guess veggies and meat. I mean, that's, that's. My roommate still brings, my, my college roommate still brings it up. She's like, I just remember you sitting there having bacon and pickles for dinner. I was like, well, I still Ooh. like both those things. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to could... make one of my characters do that. <laughs> Okay. I think that's great. I think throwing in like a milkshake with that combination could be kind of epic. Just saying, what about you, Grace? Uh, I don't have weird food combinations, but, you know, I can eat sushi for breakfast. So, I, yeah, sushi for breakfast is fine. Pizza for breakfast is fine. I don't know that I combine weird things. You never combine weird things? Well, it depends on what sushi you get. Could be a very interesting combination. It, it doesn't matter. I'm just like, I love food, but when I eat it in the day or meals aren't actually important to me. If you follow me on any of my Instagram things, I do a charcuterie board every Friday night or Instagram, Facebook, wherever. Uh, Twitter, I post these uh, nice charcuterie boards and it's so much more fun for me than eating dinner, you know? So I'd much <laughs> rather have a potpourri of things, but yeah, leftover sushi for breakfast is perfect. Okay, so Grace, if you're having sushi for breakfast, does that mean you're drinking coffee with it? Cause that's kind of gross. That's true. Well, I don't eat breakfast until about 1030 in the morning. It's I. So you're done with I, coffee by 1030? Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's more of a brunch sushi. Yeah, yeah there, there's, no, there, there, there's ever, yeah. no, there is ever. no breakfast. My husband's favorite meal is breakfast. And he'll like, let's go out. And I'm like, oh, could we go around 1030? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a, I will eat breakfast any time of the day. So That's what's your my husband. weird combo, Erica? What, what is yours? I love um, potato chips and cottage cheese. I could see that. I'm good with that. It's a good, I also do potato chips in sour cream, which is not as weird, but I think the volume of it that I consume is, you know, like I'm just sitting there like, <laughs> with it. I, I, I like, I will eat peanut butter with almost any 
thing that I can figure out that peanut butter can go good on. I, I'm one of those people that try any food on the planet. Like I will at least try it once. I'm going to Iceland and Ooh. apparently we're having fermented shark or something. I don't know. Wow. It, just, from, it, sound, it sounds like it's going to be a disaster, but I'm going to do it anyway. Like, my wonderful. motto in life is that sounds like a terrible idea. What time? <laughs> you know what the national food of Iceland is? I'd love to go with you. What is the national food of Iceland? Hot dogs. Hmm. I have That's never eaten a hot dog. What? <laughs> really? That's my How the hell have you avoided hot dogs? By choice. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like at some point you were just like, whatever. And then you're like, I'm never doing that. So I've never. No. <laughs> what turned you off from the dog i don't know everything <laughs> everything about it i can't do it i can't do it i've actually never eaten peanut butter either i'm not picky i am a foodie i eat all kinds of wonderful food but those two things i know it makes me not american but i can't i don't know i can't do it i don't, I don't know if it has anything to do with what country you're from but i just <laughs> Not human. <laughs> I was going to say, we're going to have a hard time during the zombie apocalypse, my friends. It's the right. Why shortening? And I'm like, look, peanut butter. And you're like, mm, ew. No, do you have any pills and bacon, perchance? No, I'm just kidding. No. So, Erica, your comment about gross food and eating it anyway. My husband and I took a tour of a brewery and part of the tour, they had like, you know, actual hops in their hand. And they were like, you know, these are really gross, but if you want to taste one, you can. <laughs> and my husband says, okay, yeah, no one else said anything. My husband's like, okay, I'll try one. And so he takes it and then he's like, oh, that's awful. And he's like shuddering. And I was like, okay, I'll have one. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to see how it went. It went horribly. And I still <laughs> was it one of those topic? people. You're one of those friends that if you go, oh my God, this is gross here. Try it. You'll say yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I got to see how bad it is. I don't know. <laughs> So I realized there was an exact point in time I went from being the friend that would try this stuff to going, what, why would you want me to try it if it's horrible? And it's funny because people instinctively are like, oh, this is, you should, <laughs> what is that instinct that we have that goes, you know what, this is terrible. We, you know, what we need to do, we need to share it, not eliminate it from society. We need to be like anyone in the room wants some, this is horrible. It's gross. I feel <laughs> nauseous. Have a bite. <laughs> I think it's because it's more fun if you can talk to somebody about how horrible it was. <laughs> Shared <laughs> survival. Community. Okay, let's talk about the last great book you read, Julie. You know, I, I'm constantly reading and writing all day long, every day, but I turn to audiobooks um, when I'm off now because my eyes are so shut. Let me see what's on my thing right now I just finished a really good one and I'm blanking on the name of it so let somebody go while I pull it up on my on my app and find what the title was okay Grace well if we were really smart I would say Boop and Eve's Road Trip and Mary would say Perennials and then Julie would say oh. the Eves but yes <laughs> Because you've been talk. drinking, what is the other answer? You know, I've, I've just, for me, it's really interesting because I have my own radio show. I'm fascinated by the fact that I never would have read memoir prior to doing this. And I thought memoir was only for, quite what honestly, famous people. Like, why would anybody who wasn't famous write a memoir? So I just read several really fascinating memoirs. And I have a whole list of ones that I love. I love um, Sandel Morse's uh, Spiral Shell, fascinating book. I just finished, uh, I mentioned her earlier, uh, Jocelyn Jones is Artist. Uh, how she combined a memoir of growing up and being one of the predominant coaches in Hollywood with also teaching you how to manifest and breathe and put your stuff out. I have no idea. And then the other one I just finished, and keep in mind, I don't read a lot, but these are ones I actually read and finished. Um, the other one that I just finished is called Fearless, and it is Julie Blacklow's uh, memoir of being a, her word, badass reporter, one of the first women in television news where, you know, when she got pregnant, she wasn't supposed to be on the news. She pushed people aside to talk to Richard Nixon. Uh, just fascinating. So memoir is my new favorite genre. And those are three that I just finished. 
I love that. Okay, Julie, did we find our audience? Yeah, so I mean, I have so many I want to tell you all about, but I'm going to narrow it down. Memoir has always been my favorite genre. I love it. I, I listen to it all the time. And the last one I listened to was The Storyteller by Dave Grohl, and I just loved it. I, he, I, I just think he's fantastic, and the story's delivered very, very well. But uh, gosh, there's so many, but I'm going to stick to that one. Okay. I, I love the Libby app from my library. I'm just going to give them a shout out because I'm constantly downloading audiobooks through the library. And I Fabulous. It. It's wonderful. Yeah. And there are libraries out there, a public service reminder every time somebody brings them up on this show. I love libraries. libraries. still exist physically <laughs> in the world. They're not like blockbusters. You should and we need them. them. <laughs> we need we really libraries. do. Yeah. Okay, Mary, what about you? What have All you right, read so recently? I'll go in keeping with the current conversation and I'll give you a memoir that I read recently and really enjoyed. And that's, I mean, I read memoirs, but I wouldn't say that's like my sweet spot, but um, it's called Blind Pony by Samantha Hart. And she had a very um, troubled childhood, ran away from home, got into all kinds of trouble in the 1970s in Los Angeles. And when I say trouble, it's trouble. And she pulled her life together and, you know, made something of herself through all of it. And it's just kind of just one of those amazing stories, like the strength of character that's required to have blossomed from those beginnings is quite something. Um, and I listened to it on audio. And another audio book I listened to that I got from my Libby app um, was a young adult dystopian novel called Girls with Sharp Sticks. Um, by Suzanne Young. And have you read it? You're nodding, Erica. No? Yes. I haven't oh, read no. it yet. No. Um, it's a story of a girl who's at a, I'll call it a boarding school. And she's sort of like a Stepford wife-ish kind of boarding school student, like very perfect in a very creepy or eerie kind of way. And slowly over time, <clears throat> She learns about the world outside of her boarding school and the pieces of what's the pieces of the puzzle start to come together and she figures out exactly what her boarding school actually is and what its purpose is and all the kind of crazy stuff going on behind the scenes. And it's good. It's what's like it called again? girls with what? Girls with sharp sticks. I'm writing down all the y'all suggestions so I'm gonna get them. <laughs> It's you know, I also love Brandy Carlisle's memoir it, because she also, if you listen to the audiobook instead of reading it, she sings the songs and talks about the journey that brought her to each song and writing each song. And it's so beautiful and powerful. If you like her music, it's just a really good, powerful memoir. I love that she delivers her songs as yeah. part of the story. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I have not. I actually... Uh, again, like memoirs, I like I I've been very fortunate to have people on the show that have um, written them. But yes, I do, and it's also always fascinating to me when you um, if you're an artist and you see what people went through to get to certain points. To you know, um, it's easy to look at somebody and go like. Um, you know, Tina Fey and okay, well, she was on, you know, SNL and then she was this, but you don't realize the journey they had before that. And it's not like they just showed up in New York and, you know, Lauren Michaels was like, Hey, you, you look like you'd be perfect to star on this TV show that I've had running for 400 years. You know, it's not Marilyn Monroe. That's not what happens. And I think anything like that, where you can learn somebody's journey and how they hit their, whatever their success is, yeah. for them you know and even if it's a small success and they've just gotten over a, a hurdle but they're continuing to move up because it reminds you that this is not anything you do artistically is not um necessarily an easy thing to do you might have easy parts to it but it is work to create something epic mm -hmm. i think there's all those stories about the overnight success, but usually when you dig into that, it's like 10 years leading up to the overnight success that they're just skipping over. <laughs> Mary, I was just going to say that we have, we all have a mutual friend named Patricia Sands. She's an amazing author and she writes mostly about the South of France. And she's so excited. She's there as we speak for the first time after COVID, but she and I've been talking and I was like, you know, you've done so many things and she's just a tad bit older than me. And I said, so how do you do 
do this? And she said, oh, Grace, you know, you just keep working for 10 years and you will be an overnight success as well. <laughs> <clears throat> Never give up. Never give up. There you go. It's, it's so true. It's so true. Okay. So here's a fun question. What is something that you did not realize about being an author before you really sat down? Not that you didn't want to write or you didn't write little things, but when you're like, I am going to publish this book. What is something that you're partway through this going, wow, I had zero idea this was going to be a thing? Julie? Um, that's a really good question. And when I wrote my novel, I had no intentions of ever showing it to anybody or publishing it. I just kind of did it for me. So when it went out there, I really didn't have any expectations of anything with it. I thought I might be lucky if a few close friends or family read it, you know, and that was it. I was blown away not only by the number of people who that story found its way to, but the response they gave me in response to the story and every story I've written since. And realizing that people's lives are shaped and sometimes even saved by the stories we tell has changed me completely. And I will never take for granted the privilege of being able to tell a story and give it to readers, not knowing the impact it's going to have on their lives and just hoping and praying that it'll be, you know, the right thing for the right people. But to, to hear that kind of response from readers is incredibly moving and humbling and rewarding more than anything else. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. And uh, now, unfortunately, one of you has to follow that up. So um, <laughs> they probably say the same thing. Good time, so um, Grace. Absolutely, for sure, what Julie said. I am touched every single time when a reader says, "You, your book helped me heal. Yeah, your your book helped me reach out to my children because I had a fractured relationship. Your book made me wish I had spoken to my mom more and gathered her stories." So that is absolutely at the core. You know, whether it's at a book club or it's an author talk. Those are the things at the core. And I think the other part of it, though, is the absolute surprise at how much work it takes mm -hmm. to work as an author. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I run, I run mo multiple businesses. Um, Mary runs the tightest ship over at Bookish Road Trip. You know, we know which days we post. We know we have calendars that go until 2023. <laughs> the, and, and I think that's what makes Bookish Road Trip such a successful group because, you know, we have an author takes the wheel. We have a membership drive. We have these different pieces. But I was somebody who up until two years ago thought all social media was a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that's the biggest surprise. So the, the, the gift that Julie talks about and being truly humbled by that, but also the new learning that it takes to effectively work as an author and put your work out in front of other people. Yeah, Mary, cool. And it Mary. changes daily. So as soon yeah. as you figure one thing out, you know, it's changed the next day. It's just constant which makes it fun to constantly be challenged. You know? Oh, not so much. I was supposed to do <laughs> Instagram live the other day and Instagram had changed where they put to find the live. And I'm texting Mary and I know Mary's busy because it's four o'clock and she's busy at four o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm calling <laughs> Meredith and going, where did they put the go live? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes not so fun. <laughs> you know what I, I love really that wish you think that Julie. Sometimes I wish the audience could see that other side of it, because again, it's that whole like suddenly success. You show up and you're like, I'm this graceful author. It's going to tell you all these things. But behind the scenes, you're like, I can't find the mic. <laughs> For sure. Craziness. Craziness. Yeah. Okay, Mary, what about you, my friend? Okay, What's so 100% agree with both the things that they said. And, um, but also I would say surprising to me was um, the writing community. I had been part of the writing community prior to publishing. I had belonged to some writing groups and had done, you know, lots of different little things and, and everyone had been nice and supportive. So I don't like mean to think I didn't think that, but 
when I published a book, the number of other authors who supported that, when I sent out an email and said, hey, I have a book bub deal and I'm really trying to get on the USA Today bestseller list, which I didn't quite manage, but but I was trying, but I sent this email out to a whole bunch of people. And I mean, they were blasting it all over the place. It was crazy. Just the generosity of spirit that that the community has. And I wasn't expecting that. I, I I, I did kind of think it'd be more of a, I mean, not necessarily competitive, but kind of like, you know, at least pretend nice, but kind of like the underlying competitive shit going on underneath. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, absolutely. No, I think it's true. And I think meeting a lot of authors, even if you don't realize it yourself at first, meeting a lot of authors, the moment you meet one that's competitive or superior, you know, not, not in a good way they think they're superior. You know what I mean? It's really interesting because to me, they're always the exception and not the rule of authors. Yeah. In general. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You meet, you meet somebody who's like, you know, oh, you want my autograph? It's $10. I'm like, dude, you are lucky they bought your MF book. Just sign <laughs> the crap. Like, let's get this going, my friend. You know, I always think it's weird when you run into people that are like that or are like, oh yeah, no, I've written five books. Like, Okay, cool, cool, cool <laughs> to you. You know, I don't know. I don't know. That's my my thing on it. Okay, so um, purple. If you could be any paranormal creature, yeah. The fun part is you guys don't in general write these genres, so no. I get to ask some time of people who do. But this is the best because the look on Grace's face just like five seconds ago. <laughs> made me asking that question 10,000% worthwhile. So if you're listening, you're going to want to go get the YouTube of this particular episode. <laughs> if nothing else, you know, we're entertaining. You've already heard it, but fast forward to this question. It's going to be very vital to look on Grace's face. So what um, creature would you be? So Grace, because you, you, I could tell you wanted to answer this question. <laughs> What would that be? I am so glad you did three episodes with Author Talk Network, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I'm going to defer to a woman that I think all of us know called Nola Nash, who just came out with a book called Traveler. And this is another genre I never, ever would have read. Um, there's another woman named DC Gomez. And she had me on a podcast maybe a year and a half ago. And I said, because I love to do research, I said, oh, send me your book. And I read her book and her main character in her book is a, tri a time traveling cat that talks who is part of Pharaoh's minions. Oh, that and, got very specific. You were like, I read the first <laughs> chapter and went, this is ridiculous. And by chapter two, I was totally in. And Nola Nash <laughs> writes the same kind of, um, not, she doesn't have a talking cat, but she has a character whose name I forget, um, but who puts her hands on things. And you know how I would like that. She puts her hands on things and zaps into different time things. So I'm either going to hang out with DC Gomez or Nola Nash and be one of their characters. You want to be so a time cat? Yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you, Mary. Okay, I like, I like the... I could the talking cat. No, that was good. Well done. Well done, Grace. A plus plus on the answer to that question. Yes. Uh, Mary, what would uh, you be? So I've gone through a lot of things while I've been talking, and I'm suddenly not Hobbit. Okay. <laughs> I'm already short. They have happy lives and they eat all the time. And it just kind of sounds like a fantastic way to spend life. Wow. That is literally, I mean, Grace's answer was a first, but that, <laughs> I cannot wait to tell uh, Jen, who does the host with me sometimes, uh, about that particular answer, that she's going to love that. I might have given you a different answer, but that's today's answer. <laughs> that's, I like today's answer with a, a tiara on at the time. Okay, Julie. <laughs> Julie. I honestly know nothing about paranormal stories, so I can't think of any characters, but if you just want like a little fantasy touch, you know, I would love to be one of the beautiful elves that are so magical in Lord of the Rings. Their world is so wonderful. 
or Hermione in Harry Potter. I mean, I think she's fabulous. Um, if I just oh, no, there wouldn't there wouldn't have been seven books if there was not a Hermione because I mean, somebody she, actually had to do all the things. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know a whole lot about paranormal. Is do, do you? Can you give me some suggestions? Oh, see, yeah. I I want you to remember who you're talking to here. Um, <laughs> see, I go things like full on like werewolf, but not like a cute like Twilight werewolf. I'm talking like an underworld werewolf. Yeah, you know, like full on rip people's faces. I think I don't know. I think being something like a a dragon would be pretty kick ass. Yeah. yeah. You know, if a uh, shifting dragon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there are a lot of dragon shape shift. So yeah, being a shapeshifter, I think that would be also really cool. Being yeah. able to be anybody kind of mystique, but not in a superhero way. Yeah. You know, I think also being able to be like a druid or something. Because oh. they can heal people in nature. Like there, there's a lot of I would have a hard time just settling on one. Because yeah. I'd be like, let me try all of the things. And that's you know, what you get to do as a writer. Ex look at you. Look at you <laughs> bringing that all the way around. <laughs> that's the fun of it. Yeah, it's joyful. Yeah. No, that's true. Okay, so um, this is the last question. Uh what genre would you love to write, but don't go anywhere near Mary. I go back and forth between historical fiction, which I'm afraid I'll screw up and romance novels, which I used to read like a one a day, like in my teens and twenties. And I don't read them very often anymore, but I think it would be fun to write one. Uh, I, I don't know. For some reason, I'm scared to actually do it. I agree with you on the historical anything because my research doesn't extend far enough not to piss some segment of historical <laughs> readers off. That's I what I would do. Be super detail oriented, or at least have someone who's going to edit you who is. <laughs> Maybe that's just my answer at some point when I decide to like actually do it. To find I'll someone like there good. weren't helicopters in <laughs> the 1600s. <laughs> So you need to redo this chapter where they're flying over. Or maybe I just write a fantastical historical fiction and then I can say whatever the hell I want. Exactly. Put it in the category of steampunk and then everybody <laughs> forgives everything that you do in it. It's steampunk has awesome Halloween costumes. Every time I go in a Halloween store, I'm like, those are the best costumes. I don't even know what steampunk really is, but I love the costumes. <laughs> Julie, what about you? You know, I love playing with different things and writing all sorts of different things. So everything that I've ever had an interest in, I kind of go that direction and figure out if I can do it or not. So I like the challenge of that, but I've certainly never tried sci-fi or fantasy. I mean, that was, that's so far beyond what I read or um, have ever been really into. My kids are definitely have always been, they're so far above me mentally. <laughs> so I think it's just above my head, but it would be fun to try that one day maybe i don't know i've never done it i've never thought about doing it but it might be fun just for a challenge yeah i'm not sure you can literally use the lord of the rings as an example because he's used as the example in high fantasy period because the cool part about really fantasy really. is you you get to make it all up the only thing you have to remember when writing it the number one thing is if you set a rule mm -hmm. like the only way fairies can fly is rubbing butter on their wings that is the rule. Remember yeah. that rule is in place. Yeah. And the only time you can go against that rule is if there's a plot thing you're going to explain because people will be mad if the fairy suddenly can fly without that and there's no explanation. That, yeah. That's where you get fantasy people mad. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to do that. <laughs> no, you don't. They'll dress up and be very nice people to protest which will actually just look like a party outside your house. That's what will happen. <laughs> the right kind of process. Yeah. You know what would be fun is having an anthology of authors writing outside their genres, like short stories. Yeah. See what like, we I think. Oh, let's do that, Mary, in our <laughs> spare time. <laughs> yeah. Let's do that. Julie, let, we'll just all, Erica, you can do that too. We'll just create an I'm anthology of all people writing stuff that we know nothing about. <laughs> so we know Erica will contribute historical. Yes. probably romance or something and it will be wrong so <laughs> we will enjoy it and we can find the 
why Erica shouldn't be put in charge of research of any kind because <laughs> I don't do it. Although being a horror author, I literally am one of those people with search histories that will not bode well with me if a crime is committed in my immediate vicinity and I could potentially be a suspect. I got busted busted on Facebook yesterday. So let's talk about this being a horror author for a second. So yesterday on Facebook, (laughs) on my author page, I asked for recommendations for TV shows. And somebody asked me how much violence, if I was okay with violence in a TV show. And I answered, violence is fine. And, and then I went on and continued talking. Well, apparently violence is fine or okay or whatever I said, triggered some algorithm thing. <laughs> and I'm no longer allowed to do anything on this post. But if you write horror, like, aren't you saying stuff like that? And like, in, 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 do you get like thrown into Facebook jail all the time? No, because so <laughs> funny enough, um, it's no, we don't talk about it like that. Most people, like, I think horror for people is kind of like when um, people read romances. I think all of us have probably read romances, right? You read romances. When you read them when you're, nobody ever reads, it's fine. Just go with, I'm doing an example here. Where is the community on this? (laughs) Oh, I love romance, Erica. Go. Yes. um, Romance. But I think... uh, you know, they say that a lot of women read it because then they imagine themselves and it brings sort of like that experience. They're imagining being whisked away by a billionaire to some island that he owns, whatever that <laughs> is. And she owns a coffee shop, that whole thing. Um, but, you know, horror, I had somebody talk about horror readers and they like being scared. They like the adrenaline rush of being scared or, um, uh, and not terrorized, but it's, it's really that fear. That's why people go to haunted houses and stuff. People do scare people. They go for that experience, but we don't like sit and go, oh yeah, in my last book, I killed three people and beat them with a baseball bat. And you don't have those kind of conversations like that. Mm. So it You're doesn't- You're not figuring jail, Facebook jail. No, I, I don't end up there. Just and the plus, <laughs> if, if I talk about some of the stuff like people have asked me when I've been on panels and, and not horror panels, like writer panels, and I'll say something and they'll be like, you know, they'll ask a question about like, how do you, you know, with murdering people and stuff. And then when you get into the like answer, which is very logical from a writer, will I do A, B? And then they're like, you know, <laughs> it's just, anyway, yeah. Nothing. Okay. Um, that was the last question. Did I get everybody? Let me think. Julie, did you, you answer that question, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I had a lot of lightning in my cup and I've maybe finished that entire beverage. So it's fine. It's, you know, (laughs) it's super tiny. So it went well for me. Um, Anyway, this has been amazing. So Grace, talk a little bit about the Author Talk Network again. And I'm just so grateful to my fellow panelists tonight, to you, Erica, for hosting all of us over these three episodes. Author Talk Network is really such a collaborative thing. We all came together. We have, I think, 17 different panels that we can appear on if people are interested in being a ghostwriter or writing mysteries or historical fiction or social media. So we have, you can go to our website, which is authortalknetwork.com. It is organic. We just all love working together. And as uh, Mary and Julie know, I am a big spaghetti against the wall kind of girl. I didn't know what we would do when we launched uh, in November. And we've got this ebook coming out. We're all going to be on several summits coming up. And yeah, just follow us. Uh, invite us to your book group. Invite us to your library. Invite us just to hang out like this because this has been so much fun, Erica. You do an amazing job at drinking with authors. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I need your shameless self-promotion of your book too. We're all about shameless self-promotion. So uh, my last book is The Eaves <laughs> and uh, a multi-generational, dysfunctional, see where you go at the end of the story, 4.7 stars on all of the local platforms. Very cool. And it's wonderful. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Julie, shameless self-promotion time. I don't have my book. It's called Perennials. 
flowers. I'm into flowers. It's set in Oxford, Mississippi and Sedona, Arizona. And it's about um, a family that comes together after some tough stuff to celebrate the parents' 50th anniversary. And we get to see what happens when they're all put together for a few weeks in the literary town of Oxford, Mississippi. Very cool. And Mary. I just want to, before I do do that, same shameless <laughs> thing, I want to say that I have had the pleasure of reading both of their books. And I do think our books sit nicely on a shelf together. I mean, they're all different, but I think there's a lot of overlap of themes and, um, and family relationships and things like that. So anyway, that's just, and that's just happened like randomly, not like on purpose for this pan, for this, for this podcast, but anyway. Okay. So Boop and E's road trip is the story of Boop, who's an 80 year old spunky grandma. And she's on a road trip with her 19 year old whiny granddaughter. And um, group, Boop has to deal with her past and some giant secrets she's been holding for a long time in order to help her granddaughter Eve get out of her funk and find her find her life and stop living the life her mother wants her to live very Plus, very cool everybody oh. should say boop and Eve's road trip fat five times fast while they're drinking that's the way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I don't even want to know what sounds would come out it would be like when recording last night and Erica where's your shameless promotion what's your shameless promotion um, well, uh, my, I just finished a short story. I'm in the middle of writing, um, the first book in my serial killer series called the Florida hunting grounds. Oh, and, uh, the first book is called I hunt you and Ooh. it will be out before dragon con. So even if it's by the sort of hair on my chinny chin chin, it'll probably be out, um, at the end of August. So I hunt you is the first in fun things to do in Florida because <laughs> there are a lot of fun things to do in Florida. And Florida I say that Texas. Nightmare, like when yeah. you're writing this, do you dream about these, these nightmarish things while you're writing? I don't, but probably not necessarily again, going to be helpful when I'm in an interrogation room is <laughs> I am a huge fan of true crime yeah. shows and things, yeah. but um, I can take any situation and then I go, how, how would it, how would this go a different direction? Like yeah. how would this go? So to me, that's not what I have nightmares about. You know, somebody asked actually on the last podcast, what my greatest, you know, what was the, your greatest fear? Yeah. Um, and I was like, I realized my greatest fear is getting dementia. Yeah. You know, a lot of people set sharks, spiders, yeah. clowns, like, I mean, some of, some of these things are not pleasant. There's a there's a reason, you know, swimming pools are for me much better than an ocean. Do the animal content, you know, unless you're in Florida, and then that could be a gator. So that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but it, I, I don't get scared by those kind of things. I probably would be if I encountered somebody like that. But I don't get nightmares around that. I get weird nightmares about like after watching like the notebook and then I'm like I never want to be like that it's like a cute story but I told I literally went to my kids and I'm like don't let that happen do not show up and spend an entire day telling me a story again so then I wake up and realize it's my life I'm like oh okay what a weird way to end this particular podcast but I love <laughs> that about you guys <laughs> that would be this, hard that would be hard well hopefully that will never happen to you or anyone you love that's a hard journey knocking on wood i hope they find a cure for it soon which would yeah. really be awesome so nobody ever good. has to worry about that Fortunately. but okay <laughs> fans out there this has been drinking with authors in the <laughs> author talk network which has been thoroughly amazing um my guests grace julie and mary thank you so much for being here this has thank been you. so much fun <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, yes. Of course, of course, and of course, Julie, we got to connect up as soon as this next book comes yeah. out. But that's true, Grace and Mary too. When your next one, please. The good man. You know, there's a lot of hand gestures happening right now. We can do this early, <laughs> yeah. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you, Grace and Mary. It's good to see you. Thanks, all. everybody. Good to Absolutely. See and guys, we'll see you next time. Good night. <laughs>